What's up, y'all? Welcome back. So today we're going to be reacting to a video with Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro discussing transgenderism. Just here to check the vibe, get a view on their views, discuss, because I did a video like this a while back with Thomas Sowell, and I went back and looked at the comments. There was some negative, some positive, but there was a lot of good discussion to be had in the video, so I felt the need to want to do one of these again. So without further ado, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro on transgenderism. This is why, the, the, I mean, it's, it's funny because I think that, you know, the issue that you started to become really politically prominent on, which is the, the Bill C-16 in, in Ontario and... and it's Canada, it's in federal Canada, law. In, in Canada, mm -hmm. the, the, the gender issue. Yeah. You no, know, that's the issue where you, now the question that's constantly being asked, so why do you even care? Why do you even mm -hmm. pay attention? And the answer is because... I was asked is, that earlier today. Oh, really? Like, what did you say? I'm not letting the cat have my tongue. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it has nothing to do with gender as far as I'm concerned, or that's peripheral in some sense. So the accusation, why do you care, fair enough. It's like, you know, in some way people can go to hell in a handbasket if, if they're inclined to. Mm -hmm. Now, I would rather have that not happen, but you know, people are, what would you say, doomed to their own autonomy. But I'm not saying words that other people want me to say. And the idea of compelled speech is like, the bill was this much about gender. Right. And it was this much, much about, right. oh, yeah, the government's going to tell me what to say. Hey, but, now they're regulating what therapists can say, see, therapy see, sessions. It, this is interesting because to me, the, the problem with, with a lot of this is less a, a free speech issue, even though I'm in, on the same page with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, it really is a fundamental truth issue, meaning that, yeah, you're trying to force me to say something I don't want to say. Mm -hmm. But to me, the, the, the fact that what you're trying to force me to say is so innately opposed to oh, pause right there the good pause right there is... So, with this, with this situation just, with the whole like transgender pronoun thing like that, this is my position. I don't really, I get what they're saying because they don't want to be forced. And I watched a documentary by Jordan Peterson, The Rise of Jordan Peterson. It's on uh, YouTube if you want to buy it, watch it, rent it, whatever. But I get what they're saying because it is a slippery slope when you start creating legislation that forces people to say things that they don't want to say. Now I'm not on that side because I don't really care. If you want to be called he, she, trans woman, whatever, that's fine with me. My only thing is when we get all this new shit that's going on, and even it was going on with Jordan Peterson, but I didn't know about it until recently. Zer, Zim, Chim, Flim. All right, chill out. Either he, her, even the they, them shit, I even let you slide on that one. But all the extra shit, people don't like, like, stop doing extra shit. Be, be, just do this. I know people feel different. I respect that. Your body, you don't feel like you're a woman, a man, you're nothing, whatever, but... All the extra shit, Zer, Zim, Chim, Kim, Lim, like all that, chill out. But I get what they're saying, because like once you start doing that, it's a slippery slope to other things. You could try, I would have objections to you forcing me to say that I like a particular movie, right? It may not be true, I don't like a particular movie, it would be bad if you tried to force me to say that. Uh, but the, the level of passion that I have for, for issues like this one really go to the fact that I think the fundamental good of humanity relies on basic acknowledgments of biological truth, especially when it comes to gender. Mm -hmm. and, and, and anybody who's ever dealt with children, uh, I find myself getting, you know, I, I, if I, if I look at my own political evolution, I'd say that when I, when I grew up, I grew up in a religious home, so that means that I'm pretty conservative. And then you go to college and you're living by yourself and you're not married, you don't have kids. You tend to become a little bit more libertarian, which is like, okay, you know, let everybody do whatever they're going to do and it's not going to bother me. And then you have kids and you realize that there's a pool in which we are all swimming. And that pool is going to define... Virginia, Virginia. Exactly, Virginia. exactly. Like my, my kid... That's... Now, I was I didn't grow up conservative like Ben saying he grew up conservative. I didn't really grow up thinking about politics at all. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I was playing football. I wasn't even thinking about none of that shit. People saying conservative, liberal. Like that shit was so... The furthest from my mind. I don't even know what that shit mean. Like, no bullshit. I don't even know what none of that shit meant. Because I wasn't in that world. I didn't really care about politics in that well. But I do agree. Once you have children, you really start to look at the world a lot differently. You would think when you become an adult, you may start to look at the world differently. But no, when you become an adult, and you just have to worry about yourself. You just let everybody do whatever the fuck they want to do. But when you have children... You start to look at shit like, how is this going to affect my kids when they get older? So that's why when I see certain things, California school, uh, pushing kids to do, or join the LGBT club, and that's the thing. Most people who talk about these issues, they don't necessarily have a problem with these LGBT whatever. They have a problem with you pushing on their kids. That's really the main thing. Just don't push it on the children. They said they changed the little girl's uh, gender. They changed her name on her paperwork. Like You can't do shit like that and expect parents not to go to school board meetings and raise hell because if that was me, I would raise hell. 
And I feel like most parents would. It's going to determine how my kid lives. And I want my community to reflect some of my values because I don't want my kid to live in the toxic sludge that you are, that you are creating for my kid. I don't yeah, like well, you indoctrinating a... my kids in bullshit mm-hmm. about whether yes, exactly. a boy can be a people girl really, or a girl People will say, well, I'll exceed, but not for my children. Yeah, and that's but, what Virginia demonstrated. It's yeah. like, you can come after me, but you come after my kids, and that's a whole different story. It, it, it's so fundamentally opposed to everything true, and the fact that, that, that and, and that's the insistence. The insistence isn't that people be treated humanely or be treated decently. The insistence is that your vision of yourself be reflected by me in defiance of baseline reality and in order to redefine how society as a whole works. Well, a lot of it's murky thinking. You know, if someone asked me, do I believe that there are gender-fluid people? I would say yes, and I would say a man, man who's a young man who's gender fluid. I, I know what he's like temperamentally. He's high in agreeableness. He's high in neuroticism. So he has a feminine temperament. He's more interested in people than things, and he's extremely high in openness. And so his temperament is fluid. Mm-hmm. He's creative, and so he's one thing one day and one thing the next. And his fundamental temperament is tilted towards the feminine. But that doesn't mean he's not a man. Right, exactly. So exactly. that's and then so it's murky thinking. So that's exactly right. It's it's certainly the case that one out of ten women. Now it depends on where you put the cutoff. Mm-hmm. You say, but you could say with reasonable certainty that one in ten women has a masculine temperament, and one in ten men has a feminine temperament. And so shit nowadays it might be more like five out of ten men have a feminine temperament than. One out of two, whatever you know, thing he was bringing up. That's a lot of people, mm-hmm. and those people, especially if they're also creative, mm-hmm. well, they're they're kind of at a loss in relationship to what to do with their identity, because they're pulled. First of all, they have a hard time catalyzing their identity. Creative people have a hard time mm-hmm. catalyzing mm-hmm. it. It's like the definition of creativity. They're protean, mm-hmm. and so there there are, have been people who play at the edges of gender identity forever. And fair enough, and sometimes that's even admirable if it's done in a sophisticated way. And it's charismatic. So you see it in Mick Jagger, you see it in David Bowie, mm-hmm. you see it, and you see it in people like Madonna as well, because Madonna had a hard edge, you know, that was very masculine. And all the Marvel superhero women have a hard masculine right. edge. And so we find that charismatic because those people are also integrated. But the, the notion that there's such a thing as gender, that's not right. There's variability in personality and temperament. And the idea that right. that, that there's no such thing as biological sex, that's, a, that's, that's, that's just insanity. insane. It's insanity. They've, they've, mm. they've abstracted gender from sex and then read gender back into sex yeah. is more important than sex. It's completely... Well, and then why insist upon the biological modifications? Right. If there's no such thing as sex, it's like, well, what? then just act out your role. Right. Leave your body alone because it's irrelevant anyways. Well, it turns out it's not irrelevant. You have to go through the that's, surgical that, transformation. That's a good point because I feel like it's a lot of people dramatic say that shit. Answer. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Then, like, why do you go and get things? Now, of course, people will say, well, you know, if you want to get it, you can get it. But I feel like at the end of the day, this is my thoughts on this, right? It could all be so simple for everybody. Everybody could come to common understandings about certain things. It's either you're a man, woman, because even if you're trans, it's trans man, trans woman. But once you start to throw out all these other 50 different genders and this, People who would, like, I can understand trans shit, right? Do I agree with this as far as, like, what I, you know, is that me or my kids? Like, that's a different story, but I can understand that. You a guy who feels like they was born a woman, now you're a trans woman. I can understand that. That's understandable. That's easy to explain. Gay, guy likes guy. Lesbian, girl, like, easy to explain. But when you start having all these other phenomenons that are just, which make that make like the cringe TikToks and the viral TikToks of weird looking people. That's when you're like out of the realm. And those people get tied in with regular, you know, LG, lesbian, gay, bi, trans people. And it kind of, you know, makes other people kind of like look at that whole community as a certain, like, that's a, like, they look at it like a shit show. Because a lot of those other things and genders just really just feel like a bunch of made up things. There's no disrespect to those people, but you got to see how people may look at something like that. Like, I was watching the Jordan Peterson documentary, and he was debating a professor. Professor said, I am a non-binary trans person. But it's like, what do you trans? If you're nothing, then what are you transitioning to? Why not just say I'm non-binary, but you're non-binary trans, which makes me think you transitioned from 
male to female, but you I'm confused now. I don't hate you though, but I'm I'm confused. You gotta give me it. Like some of the shit is confusing. To a question that for 99% of people who are ambivalent about their gender identity would be best solved without surgical intervention. Yeah. And then this, so now in Canada, because they banned conversion therapy, it's now all affirma affirmation therapy. Right, this is this There's is no insane. such thing as affirmation therapy. Right, no, they, they, this, it, it's insane. I mean, the, 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 the semantic game that was used in order to say, well, conversion therapy, which was at one time, electric, you know, using electric shock mm -hmm. to treat homosexuals. Yeah. And saying that that's the same thing as you have a gender confused 12 year old. Look, I had a 14 year old kid who was a client of mine. And, uh, you know, he, he was in the m mid stages of puberty. He was a pretty creative kid, um, agreeable kid as well, mm -hmm. right? And that's important. So he had a bit of a feminine temperament. And that also meant he could be pushed around fairly easily. Mm -hmm. Well, there was an aggressively guy gay in this gay guy in his school is hitting on him and trying to convince him that he was gay. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't know. So he wanted to talk to me about it. It's like, well, I wasn't going to tell him. I didn't. What the hell do I know about right. this kid? Exactly. You know, <laughs> and I wanted to hear what his problems were and how it might be sorted out, what he wanted. And like, that's that's what you do in therapy is you help people sort out their problems. Now, this idea is you come to me with an axiomatic claim whatever it is about your identity, and my job is to rubber stamp it. It's like, that's not, I'm not a therapist then. So this is not only insane, this insistence. Like, I like to think of truth, untruth, and anti-truth, mm -hmm. right? And the notion that therapists affirm is an anti-truth. Because, look, let's say you come to me and you say, uh, you, you have a proposition about yourself, and I say, no, I'm your therapist. No, that's wrong. It's like, that's not good therapy. But neither is you have a proposition about yourself and you're disturbed enough to come to a therapeutic session. And I say, yes, you're right. It's like, I don't know if you're right. Mm -hmm. And if you're so right, why are you here? Like, what are we talking about if entire, you're already it, right? It's, it's a destruction of I, I know people hate these guys, right? And I'm not on the side of hating these guys. Like, I got his book and I got two of his books. So I don't hate these guys. Do I agree with everything they say? No. But I feel like it's... Community, world, everybody's polarized, everybody got to hate everybody for whatever reason, whatever, whatever, right? But if you really just sit down and listen to a talk and you filter out all the shit you read and hear about these guys, you might actually realize you agree with them on a lot of different things. Now, I said, maybe not everything. Like Jordan Peterson says, if someone, uh, this was maybe he changed his mind, but this wasn't a documentary. If someone asked him to call them by a certain pronouns, he, would, he wouldn't do it, right? If I knew one person who went by something like Zer, like I would probably never even say that anyways. I would be like, hey, where's Zer? Is it? I'll figure out another word. But if they like vehemently ask me, I don't really give a fuck that much to not do it. But I do agree with him as far as creating legislation and forcing people to do it. That's where you get a little bit dicey and a little bit shifty. But this is a good conversation so far. It's basically the only form of therapy that we know to work. Yes, Cognitive yes. behavioral therapy is yeah. it's all about oh, saying so, that this So are therapy. the rest of them. They're all predic... This is one of the things that's interesting about clinical psychology. Every single school of psychotherapy is predicated on the idea that free expression of thought or, or the free transmutation of behavior is curative. And it's true with cognitive behavioral therapy, just like, just like psychoanalytic therapy. It's all the same thing. And also the other axiom of therapy is voluntarily expose yourself in measured doses to what you're afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so that's an interesting thing because the psychoanalysts believed when the behaviors first came up with exposure therapy, they had it formulated wrong. They thought you learned to be afraid. So you're, you're normal mm -hmm. and then something hurts you and then you learn to be afraid of it. That's wrong. You're always afraid except when you learn not to. So they had it exactly mm -hmm, backwards, mm -hmm. neuropharmacologically, and it really matters, this, this, is, this, this matters. That doesn't mean you can't learn some fears, you can, but mostly you unlearn okay, terror. Say, I don't know, mm -hmm. is it true? Right? So children are afraid to get away from their mother. It's because they're afraid of the entire world. Well, you have to learn how not to be, and you don't learn that by habituation, because that was the idea. So mm -hmm. you take someone who's afraid, they've been conditioned to be afraid, you expose them to what they're afraid of, and then you have them do relaxation exercises so they counter condition. Mm -hmm. Well, then it was discovered, and they don't have to do the relaxation exercises. It's like, oh, well, it still works, just exposure. It's like, well, they get less afraid. 
when you expose them because their fear habituates. Like, so then the psychoanalyst said, well, if they get less afraid of that particular thing, the symptoms are just going to substitute because that fear of an elevator, say, was reflective of a deeper fear, fear of death. I had a client I exposed to an elevator, the doors opened, she said, that's a tomb. It's like, and, and her fantasy about the elevator was, it was a place she was going to die in, of mm -hmm. a heart attack, mm -hmm. while people were discomforted and, what would you say, made uh, contemptuous of her foolishness while she was suffering and dying. Mm -hmm. So, social alienation and death, that was the elevator for her. So, we expose her to the elevator. What does she learn? Not to be afraid of the elevator. No, no, no. She learns she can tolerate those fears. She learns to be brave. Mm -hmm. And so the psychoanalysts were exactly, they were diametrically wrong because if you expose someone to anything they're, they're afraid of, effectively, they get less afraid of everything, right? And so that's partly why psychotherapy is curative in that manner, is that people discover that they're bigger than their fears. But they don't discover that the fears are trivial. I, I think that the cult of authenticity is going to be the destruction of all psychotherapy then. Because if the cult of authenticity is that your true authentic feelings are what makes you you, then the attempt to make you brave in spite of your fears is a suppression of your fears. It's, mm -hmm. almost, like a, it's almost like a Freudian analysis of you're suppressing your sexual desire and this is not full authenticity. Yeah, right. Why isn't the fear you? Right, exactly. The authentic you. Exactly. And I, and I think that mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where we're going. It seems like the... Mm -hmm. the yeah, well, uh, so this, 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 this movement towards unity that we were talking about, this is a place I think where like informed liberals and conservatives could meet. It's like, well, there is this authenticity, let's say, and drive for adventure. And you see that elevated to the highest place in some sense in the more careless Disney movies. But the full manifestation of that in an integrated sense is the drive towards authenticity inside this higher order unity. It has to be, because otherwise it's disuniting. It causes fragmentation and chaos. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be subordinate to a higher order end. And then you might say, well, what is that? Part of that's the reciprocal, reciprocal altruism that the evolutionary biologists are always on about. It's like, some for you, some for me, mm -hmm. some for you, some for me, in measure, right? And that makes both of us richer. And so that's part of the higher order unity, and people are intensely reciprocally altruistic. That's great. It's good. Actually, if I can get a re-up on something, that would be awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. And so, um, it's authenticity in the service of what? Now, when P Pinocchio becomes real, he's already rescued his father, right? So. He's established an accord with the tradition that gave birth to him already. He's revitalized that. So when he wakes up, he's not free. He doesn't have any strings on him anymore, but he's already existing in a harmonious relationship with, with his father. It's a big deal. And one of the lovely things about what happens to me as a consequence of my lectures is that lots of fathers and sons come up to me and say, we've really worked out our relationship. It's like, and they're both like, you've never seen smiles like that. It's really something to be stopped on the street and to be told that. Joy to see people so very, joyful about like, that. Because it's their heart desire, you know? <laughs> Emotional. And that's guy. that integration of that drive to autonomy with but I understand that because the older I get the more like emotional about certain shit I get. Like like real shit. Not like dumb shit, but like real shit. And I guess for him, seeing change in people or feeling that what he does is influencing people I can see how that would bring like well with the family, with the father, with the mother, the broader community. All that has to be in a higher order unit. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's that, the conservative insistence, right? It, exactly. Is that there, there are these the wall, as you said before, the walls have to exist. You can have autonomy, but the autonomy has to exist within the walls. And then once you let the autonomy or the rationalism destroy all the walls, well, there's, there's no, no autonomy without the walls. There's right. just chaos. All right, so you can watch that full clip. It's linked down below if you want to watch it by yourself. There's three, two other clips that they released, or as you see, the full thing is available at dailywire.com. But I think it was a good discussion, good talk. Only thing I don't agree with is, you know, only thing I don't agree with is calling people what they want to be called. Or even, like, you know, sometimes they'll say, like with the swimmer, the, the swimmer at UPenn. They'll say it's a man that's masquerading as a woman. Yeah, people believe that, but I choose to just be like, I'll say trans woman. That's fine. Now, do I, we could, there's two different discussions. I'll call you trans woman, but then when it comes to the actions of you being a trans woman, I don't agree with you whooping girls' ass in swimming or biological females in swimming. I don't agree with that. I don't feel like that's okay. I don't feel like that's right. I don't feel like that should be, you know, happening. Because within that U-Pen thing, there's a lot of 
biological women that have worked their entire life to be to get to this point, to get to college, to go to NCAA championships and this and that, and then you just wipe the floor with them. They've only got so much time to realize those dreams. And now you, as a biological male, now trans woman, have shattered those dreams. Especially because usually when we talk about sports, the trans people, it's usually like kids, or not kids, but you know, like high school kids. That's been the norm, right? But when you look at the U-Pin swimmer, you were swimming for the male team for a certain amount of time. So you were good enough to make it to college as a male. This is one of those scenarios where they're like, well, any person that's trans can't just pop up and become athletic. This is a person that was already – you got. if you're in swimming, if you're in college, you could consider yourself like elite. Not like the super elite, you're not Michael Phelps, but you were elite to a sense. You swim with that team for two years, and then you transition to a woman the next year, and you're swimming at similar times. That's where the pushback comes. The pushback to me doesn't come on your nature, what you believe you are. I don't give a fuck about that. Do you a biological male? You want to be a woman now? You want to get tits or whatever? Hey, whatever. That's on you, big dog. But when certain things get put in place and uh, advantages start going here and there and disadvantages for others, start going, that's when I feel like people speak out and they're against you. So let me know what you guys think about the comment section down below. Let me know what you think about the talk between them. I really had to just tune in to the last like three minutes because they was going on some shit that, you know, I ain't, wanna, I ain't had nothing to say. So it was a good conversation. Appreciate you guys for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. Make sure you give the video a big thumbs up as well. See you guys next time. It's your boy D-Friend. Peace.